communication, coaching, Costa Rica, a sales masterclass, and more is what you're about to experience. The Remarkable People Podcast. Check it out. Remarkable People Podcast. Listen, do, repeat for life. Hello, friends. Welcome to this week's Remarkable People Podcast episode. This week, we are going to spend time with our friend Richard Blank. Richard's episode is different than our normal episode, where instead of focusing more on his personal journey and story, it's a sales masterclass on communication, call centers, bettering yourself as a business owner and communicator, and so much more. So truly get your pens and paper ready. You are going to want to listen to this episode, take notes, apply it, rewind it, and play it again. So Richard is an entrepreneur. He is a sales individual. He is a CEO. He is a coach, and he does a lot of things, but he does it well. He studies it, becomes the expert, and now he's here to teach us how to do it too. So I'm David Pasqualone. Welcome to the Richard Blank story, and I can't wait to hear the results you drive from this episode. Hey, Richard, how are you today, brother? Hey, Costa Rica, I'm doing great in Central America. It might be rainy season, but still it's sunny down here in regards to personality. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm a little, I'm not jealous, but I'm like super like wanting to be there with you and do this episode live. I've always wanted to go to Costa Rica and I've heard it's nothing but gorgeous. Is that your experience? It's amazing for ecotourism, the temperatures in the, you know, high 70s, early 80s, you know, every day. So it's very comfortable weather. And pretty much we have two seasons, a wet and a dry season. But if you're really into ecotourism, healthy living, it's pretty much the place to be. I think we can fulfill all your needs if you're looking for adventure. Awesome. Yeah, I just went skydiving this weekend. And to go skydiving in Costa Rica is on my do list so i don't want to say bucket list because i don't want to wait till i'm dead so yeah. have you ever skydived there i haven't done that yet nor bungee jumped you know i think if something happens in my life where i need to jump out of a plane or to save myself i can definitely do it but i'd rather maybe play golf or do some surfing oh man it's so wonderful but enough about my desire to go to costa rica let's talk about you I just okay. told our community a little bit about you just a little bit and they're pumped to hear your episode before cool. we start, though, if you were going to summarize, they're going to get to hear your story from birth through today, and then we'll transition into where's Richard going and how can we help you. But if our listeners right now are thinking, should I listen to this episode or not? What's the one main purpose you want them to walk away with when this episode is complete? No, absolutely. Fortune favors the brave. And All then right. I think if you're able to take a chance in life and to drink life, and to be responsible in regards to your finances and your family, if there's something inside of you that is pushing you towards a destiny, you should take it. And sometimes dreamers walk alone and you might not have people to compare notes with you or at least to give you advice. And as I'm saying, you, you might be seen as crazy or outside the, the mark when you have these thoughts, but at the end, you're usually the one that gets vindicated and people say that they were believing in you all along. And but it's really one of those things where, David, if you can look at yourself in the mirror, you know that every day you're striving towards something that will enrich your life. You won't live with regret. And Amen. So ladies, the distance, yes. Yeah. Oh, I apologize, brother. There's a short delay. So ladies and gentlemen, you just heard right out of Richard's mouth. He's going to go through his story. And we're going to talk about not only his highs and his lows and everything's in between, but that kind of message, you're going to get the practical steps of how Richard did it, and you can too. So at this time, Richard, let's talk about you. Where were you born? What was your upbringing like? Siblings, normal family, crazy family? Take it away, brother. Well, everybody's got a crazy family. It just depends on what level of crazy. But uh, no, I'm originally from Northeast Philadelphia. I graduated the proud Abington High School back in 91. And unlike a lot of my friends that were going to Ivy League to study medicine, law, engineering, and architecture. I doubled down on my favorite language, which was Spanish. I was a Spanish communication major at Arizona. 
interned for Telemundo during those years. Postgrad, I was working for the importers of Corona. So all my life, I was working with things that involved Spanish sales, promotions, and public relations. And at 27 years old, I was given a one in a million opportunity to move to Costa Rica to work in my friend's call center for just a couple months. Now, not a sea level. This was really just from the inside and out. And when I was here, I got a chance to sit in the cubicles with the Ticos. I got to see the good and the bad and really learn the business. And I think the thing that was most important for me, besides the technical side, I got a chance to really see the dignity that people were looking for. And if you extend empathy towards individuals, you might reduce attrition, get the most out of somebody where you can delegate and promote them. And I think some of the greatest experiences I got, I almost consider it my graduate school, were the four years that I worked at my friend's call center, because in essence, after leaving that center, it gave me enough self-confidence and self-reliance to start my own center. And here we are today, David, close to 15 years of an anniversary and 150 agents. Now, what was your childhood? Because we go through your background matters because it makes you the man or woman you are today. You are a man, but you know what I mean? So was your upbringing, did your brothers, sisters, only child, what was that like? That's a great question. I had a very loving family and I used upper middle class existence with private schools and we belonged to a country club and I was given a car when I was 16. So I had everything that I wanted growing up, which was wonderful for, for comfort and very generous of my parents. I have an older brother, four years older than me with the same name as you, his name is David Blank. And it was always fun because when we played athletics in the backyard and stuff, he would always push me to be better and it really instilled a lot of confidence in me to compete with bigger kids. And, but you know, there's a lot of expectations, my friend. I mean, you are given a lot of opinions and I should have been following in my family's footsteps. That was at Harvard Law, Columbia Business School in Washington and Lee undergrad. And so imagine those sort of shoes to fill. And so maybe I was considered the romantic and renaissance of the family because instead of finance and economics and law, I decided to become bilingual. Now, my best argument was my great grandparents that came to the United States at the turn of the 20th century. They came from Eastern Europe. They were in New York. They were in the garment industry and they had to learn English. And so in essence, it just skipped two generations. And I was just reliving my nomad blood and moving south, not just going back to Europe. And, you know, the main thing is, David, as well, to be honest with you, everybody wants adventure. I really wanted to leave a castle to slay a dragon, save a princess and be a prince. And since the world is so small, how do you get a chance for this sort of adventure? And so I guess by getting past my parents' guilt, I decided to take this one in a million chance and to move abroad and see what could happen. Nice. Now, when you got there, was it culture shock? Was it purely like enthusiasm? Like, I can't believe I'm here. Was there a transition period from culture to culture? Wonderful question. That's why you have one of the best podcasts out there, David. It's, let me, let me go over a lot of those things. First, since Spanish was my major in college, it was easy for me to acclimate the language. Secondly, it showed a very good first impression on my end. Even though I was a guest in this country, I really was able to put my best foot forward. My junior year in college, I lived in Spain. So I had a chance to do it for two semesters over Christmas break as well. So living abroad and being an expat was something I was already used to. It was just a different culture in Costa Rica compared to Europe. But no, I had friends here. I had some way to earn a living and I was stimulated. It was really about shedding a skin and being almost reborn. And I knew that I was following in my natural footsteps because every day I was elated. I couldn't wait to get up, going to work, going to work where? I was increasing my skills and learning something and literally having the best time of my life in my late 20s when it should have already been over. And then I also realized something else, my earnings potential. The call center industry is exceptionally lucrative. And the fact that I could hire specialists in the IT department, I could hire attorneys to assist me with the labor laws and a human resources director, I could hire everybody. But the special sauce, David, that you and I could put the cherry on top, is knowing somebody's name and doing old school coaching and investing in them and realizing that feeding families comes first, the riches come second. 
because the gold and the jewels lose their luster. What are you looking for after a while? For me, it was really, it was really about positive reinforcement, David. I just want to see if this could work. If this long shot could pay off. And there are people out there with deeper pockets or maybe some degrees in IT that could run circles around me. But I tell you what, I have pinball machines here. I have a gamification culture. I'll know somebody's name and break bread with them. And a lot of the times just by extending that sort of appreciation and acknowledgement towards an agent that really feels expendable, I've been specifically given that sort of compliment back from somebody on why they've been with me for over a decade because our foundation was just so strong. And so it's been very easy for me, my friend, to scale because yeah, so I just do it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I apologize for the delay, Richard. So if I'm hearing you correctly, some of the takeaways for our listeners so they can have the same type of success is you went in and you were excited, but you also prepared. You didn't just jump in blind. You knew the language, you prepared, you knew there would be a cultural difference. So you were ready for that mentally, even though you might not have known the details, you knew it would be different. Is that correct? Yes, but my brother, walking into a call center environment is kind of like what you see in the movies. That is a certain sort of vertical and office company culture. But if you're walking into a call center, you need endurance. There's quality control departments that actually grade your calls. You need to know a CRM, a phone system. And there's certain sort of metrics and KPIs you need to learn. So it's something you can't just, you can't make up an answer or some try to talk it away because you really have solid statistics there to see your production. But for me, I saw the art in the speech. Most people are doing things today with omni-channel non-voice support, which is chat and email, and it's okay. But when I saw people on the phone, David, I saw individuals that were retaining a client, were doing an upsell, Maybe getting a referral. And how about this, my good friend? Getting an exit interview from somebody just in case competition earned their business. Is there something we did where we fumbled the football and lost it? And so as a communication major, I found this to be exciting because there were a lot of codes that I figured I could crack to be able to increase talk time, increase conversion ratios, and just make a ton of money. And my statistics were there because I was in a controlled focus group environment for four years. So I did earn my stripes. And by going from agent to owner, I really avoided all of those levels of supervisor management, which could have tainted me or made me just lose my essence and who I am, David. And if, if that makes any sort of sense, you and I are still pure in the art that we're doing here. Yes, and then I love what you said about the person's name, you know, Dale Carnegie, after the Bible, I think it's the most popular book in the world, most converted languages, how to win friends and influence people. And he has a whole chapter yeah. on it. You know, the name Jesus should be the most popular, but the name that people love to hear most is their own. And you mentioned yeah. that like two or three times already. So talk yeah. about that personal message because so many people, you get calls and you read it, they read you a script and they're like, they're just showing up for work. You became someone who became a master of the art. So for people, whether they are in a call center or any career, talk about the importance of mastery and really be getting personal. Let's talk about the composure, David, and then I can also go over the delivery. Someone needs to know how to wield a sword before they use it. And so when somebody walks into my call center, what I do is I put fear into perspective. By learning a second language, it's 10 times harder than any sort of project I'll put them on. Imagine that sort of structure and discipline. Number two, you don't want to compromise somebody's ethics. You see the Wolf of Wall Street and Boiler Room, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and Prime Gig, and Hollywood does it. And these are amazing artists of speech. But as I mentioned, you have a thousand ways to earn a dollar if you're marketable. You can choose the sort of campaigns that you do that can make you feel good about yourself. But also, it's about dedicated practice. A lot of people just grind through the calls. They have hedging issues. They say sir and ma'am instead of the name drop of personal pronouns. But it's just one thing that these individuals need to have that sort of structure. And finally, before I go into the execution of this, I would prefer to have somebody with no experience at all. I can teach you a CRM and a phone system, but a lot of people are not coming in with bad habits or a cancer, or as we call them, jumpers. 
that will just taste it and jump because they, you know, they just don't want to be there and make the calls. So that's one thing. I just want to make sure that you have the balance and the stability to make these calls and be brave and to do it properly. Now, the execution of the call. I, I also think that individuals should be really focusing on their phonetics. To me, I, I believe there's many tell signs with your tone, rate, pitch, and duration. Somebody should have a consistent tone of empathy and confidence. I also believe in mirror imaging on a rate and a pitch so you can find spikes and dips to ask tie downs and pin down questions. You can rake questions when you give a long list, pausing in between each one for positive or negative reinforcement, taking it from a horizontal to a vertical with open-ended questions. I believe in military alphabet because people have exotic names or you just don't want emails to bounce back. How about this? This is a million dollar piece of advice. The positive escalation. Everyone is always so concerned about the gatekeepers that are holding you back from speaking to a decision maker. Well, why don't we reverse that sort of mass and use it to your advantage and woo way? So there's no resistance there. What I like to do initially when someone picks up a phone call is to give a company name spike. I'll ask how a company is doing and say the name of the company better than the person answers it. They in turn will then, you know, be, their ego defense gets reduced. It almost sounds like mystery shopper or not even been there before. Like I've been familiar with the place. Secondly, they will ask who I am or what my company is. Maybe they might ask it in a negative tone and that's where we use a buffer boomerang technique. I will buffer your negative tone. I will name drop you. I'll repeat what the question is and let you know it's an excellent question and then send it back to you in a positive way. And so these are ways to show active listening, using name drops, readjusting tones of calls. And as I was mentioning before, studying the phonetic microexpression reading, which is mirror imaging, the rate and the pitch, but that could still be manipulated on a 30 second to two minute interval of attention span. And so I believe that the answering speed is a subconscious thing that people cannot manipulate. And the funniest thing is that since we're in this environment where we lose three of our senses, our taste, touch, and smell, our hearing should be expanded naturally. But I also believe in image streaming where you can use adjectives and descriptions for your visual. So it does still exist. But the greatest tell sign of all, non-visual, is actual silence. I mean, so if you see that as an insurance policy on your tone rate and pitch studying, that will give you easier calls. And so it will show active listening. You will reduce any sort of rabbit holes. You've done positive escalations of somebody that transferred the call. I'll be letting the gatekeeper know they're helpful and letting you know how amazing they are. I'll do it verbally and I'll do it written. And so these are the sort of things. And these aren't things that will compromise your ethics or values. But it's a nice circle in case you have to call that company back. It's separating you from other companies that are prospecting. And it's at least showing good faith and good intentions prior to any sort of contract. Yes. And to our listeners right now who maybe aren't marketing and sales professionals, what Richard is talking about, he's given you a master's class condensed. And I know the typical podcast is more focused on his story with tips along the way. But listen to what he's saying, because it doesn't matter what field you're in. The communication principles he's giving, talking about how most of your communication isn't even in the words. It's in the, the body language. It's in the inflection in your voice. It's in the pauses. And I remember teaching at a college, Richard, and the most successful teachers, did you ever see the studies how even teachers are stutters? They have a higher retention rate among their students because they're constant stuttering, it may be a distraction to the conscious mind, but to the unconscious mind, it gives them the time and ability to catch up and process what they're saying. So if you're listening to this, rewind, listen to what Richard's saying, because there's so much gold and it doesn't matter if you're a janitor, a teacher, a marketing executive, a call center specialist, IT provider, this will help you in life. So you've obviously not only went to college for communications, but you've perfected your art. And you mentioned how you were 27 when you got to Costa Rica. Take yes. us through from 27 to today. What was your life journey like? And then we'll tie into the professional, where you are today and where you're heading. 
Well, those four years that I worked at my friend's center, once again, was my graduate school, but I got to master Spanish, master the industry. And then when I left my friend's center, I worked at my family's real estate company for a while before the market dropped out, but I was making calls out of my home, which was great and had a couple of people working with me. Back in the States? Or yeah, back in the States. My brother okay. is a broker out in Arizona. So I was doing some lead gen with him with a couple agents here. And that was successful until about, what, about 2006, 2007? Yes. In America, if you're listening, we have listeners from all over the world, but if you're listening in America, I think it happened in a lot of countries, but especially in America, they were handing out loans fraudulently like candy, and there was what they call the bubble burst in 2007 to 2009, and it was just a disaster in the real estate market. Is that how you'd summarize it too, or did I miss 100%, something? and we were just simple listing agents doing cancels, expires, and FISBOs, but... Yeah, not really you did anything wrong to your brother. I meant just... How, what led up to the, the the pop of the bubble? That's that was of course, and those were exciting times. I mean, you were calling people, you were looking at the MLS, you were complimenting their curb appeal and the, you know, the paint that they chose on the walls in their sport court, and you know, my conversations got, I guess, custom made as well, because you really wanted to talk to people because they were receiving so many calls that day. And what separates you from somebody else is. Once again, putting things aside, you were, you were mentioning something earlier, David, about vocabulary. It is important, your phonetics, the sound of speech, but semantics are also very important as long as rhetoric. And I always believe in the thesaurus, because if you can think of certain similes to be able to expand your vocabulary so it's more diplomatic and strategic, it work for you. Best example I could share with you would be the word help. People use it on the phone, it's okay. But I prefer using words like assist, guide, and lend a hand. It's the same message, it's just a different delivery. And what we can do is we can add momentum instead of trying to fix emotion. And so I've seen just by making those sort of, and here's another one. Instead of saying, excuse me, I would say, David, for my clarification, was it ABC or one, two, three? Yeah. There are a lot of small swords we'll fall on, which is fine because we just don't wanna ruin the momentum. It's like, listen, I'll, I'll clean your spill, I'll pay for the bill, and then we'll get out of here. Let's just not ruin the night. And so there are certain things that I will do on a phone call just to keep the happy going. And those are the sort of soft skills that I think that people would enjoy. And so, you know, besides the real estate, and then when that ended, I, I launched my website October 4th of 2007 and landed my first account February 6th of 2008. And you're going to love this. It was one seat, one week. That's it. <laughs> but I, I was so happy because the long shot paid off. I saw the spark and I knew if I was taking very good care of this, I could make it into an inferno. And there's nothing more pleasing than creating something from nothing. And I believe the stars were aligned. And so, as I mentioned before, if you become accountable to your clients, so there's no surprises, you put your best foot forward, the chances are if you can work through the tough times together, imagine how easy it'd be during the good times. And so these are sort of the foundation structures that I had with the relationships with my clients that enabled me to last so long. But I tell you what though, the one thing that did surprise me was the natural attrition. Maybe I was naive and foolish to think that if somebody started with me, they'd be with me for 40 years getting that gold watch and talking about all the good times. But no, there's competition out there. And people leave for various reasons. It could be a scheduling conflict, David, at the university. Or maybe their boyfriend or girlfriend works at Amazon and they go there. Or, you know, potentially it could be closer to their home if they need to go for training or on site. Or... Yeah, well, even if they're marketable, there are certain places that have more competitive commission structures, but they'll never ever say that Richard and David gave them the walk of shame, made them cry, embarrassed them. We don't do things like that. Our goal is to promote you and find ways for you to be your best. We're not the kind of boss that does things like that. We have leverage. I'd rather promote you than fire you. And the bosses that do do that have an issue. And they also have to realize something else. You can play big shot for a day, but if nobody shows up tomorrow, you don't have a company. <laughs> so you gotta be very true. careful about that sort of balance that you're looking for. That's very true, very true. So from that first account, that first seat in 2008 to today, take us through your journey. 
I was renting a turnkey station from a blended call center. So I really did not have any sort of privacy. And it was almost like a glorified internet cafe. It was an excellent way for me to be extremely conservative with my money in the beginning, to pay the salaries, to pay the taxes, to pay the guy's rent for the month for the station and to make my margin. And after the first couple months, you know, I was maybe about a half a dozen agent. And then come, I guess, April, I landed a whale and I went from like six agents up to like 80 quickly. And, you know, I held on for dear life on that one. And what I realized after a period of time, paying a la carte did not make sense after, let's say, about two dozen agents. So after about a year of paying premium, I'd saved enough money to then rent out a space, buy the equipment, buy the furniture, and build out about 150 seats. Now, I did that for about six years. And then I had enough finances to be able to build out where I'm currently at, a 300-seat capacity center that is ours. With neon lights, art deco, you know, the whole shebang. But slow and steady is the way to go, just in case there's a setback. And I always believe in acting your wage. I know you want to impress people and it doesn't need to be, you know, grungy. But then again, you shouldn't overextend yourselves because you shouldn't be panicked and pressured in order to pay your lights. Because that's the sort of thing that the agents can sense. And I feel that you need to be exceptionally responsible in regards to your payments and job security. Yeah, and let's talk about that. A lot of people have the misconception that business, oh, if I get, if I get accounts, I'm good to go. But hypergrowth puts out just as many companies out of business as no sales. So right. going from six to 80 very fast when you landed that whale, talk about some of the practical steps as a leader that you took that our listeners can take as well to handle that kind of hypergrowth. I was very fortunate because when you buy used items, it could be beneficial or sometimes you don't want to buy used <laughs> used items, but with with electronics in Costa Rica, it, electronics and cars are exceptionally expensive because of the 80% tax, the import tax. And so if I was able to purchase something that was literally brand new, might've been used for a month or even in the box, I was taking it because there was a lot of call centers that were going out of business. And so for me, I was able to get it for a fraction of the price. You know, there's nothing wrong with furniture and computers. So that saved me an enormous amount of money. And then secondly, that sort of growth I needed to delegate and I would never bring in an outside supervisor. I always had to take people from the inside because they proved themselves and they got that sort of respect. Somebody could be with me just a couple weeks, but if they show that sort of dedication and they're coachable, pen at the ready and showing up on time, there's no reason they can't be as far to my night. And under my supervision, I can't mold them into being a killer supervisor, especially with my company culture. And so that was another thing. And, you know, also the spacing, because when you're growing so much, you, you, you don't want to max yourself out and you want it to be comfortable. And so there, once again, it was almost by default, pushed me into looking for more space, which was great. And I guess it's about turning down more accounts than you accept, David, because it's a very strict Catholic country. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody can go home and tell their parents what they do for a living. So I guess I was exceptionally selective of what grew as well. I could have grown faster, but I just wanted to do it in a little bit more conservative way. Yeah, and to add, and you're the expert at this, Richard, if you're listening to this and like, where do you find this equipment? Where do you find this furniture? Look to the top 100 companies because you have companies like Microsoft and Boeing and they have so many billions of dollars flowing through them. They're regularly buying new equipment for their people and they just give away. I remember living in Washington state and they had furniture that was six months old and they put posts out. If you can pick it up this week, it's yours for free. Mm -hmm. And people would go and get, I mean, very expensive high-end office furniture for free. Or like That's you right. said, equipment, call center equipment, A grade for pennies on the dollar. So look outside the box. And do you have any other comments for startups, Richard, that might be helpful? Yes, absolutely. I mean, for your audience that can see me, I'm in a three-piece suit right now. So if I had shown up there to purchase this, most likely they'd be charging 20 to 40% more. So my suggestion is like myself living abroad or somebody that's an expert in an industry, having them represent you. 
because they're the ones that know people. They're the ones that can get you the best deals. So put your pride aside. You don't need to be there on every, on every situation. And so I needed to have specialists that knew where to find this for me at the best price, naturally, of course. Yeah, delegation, you've mentioned that three times in this interview. Talk about the importance of that. You can't do everything yourself and you're not the expert at everything, but you're the expert at people. So how do you view delegation? You gotta see which sort of individuals are long-term. And I can almost tell from the beginning, if somebody comes to my call center, they'll fill out my application and give us a resume. And it's the same thing, all the bells and the whistles. But I usually ask them to flip the paper on the other side, David, and write me a coming of age moment of when you beat up a bully or saved a kitten. And so you kind of get to see the inside psyche of how somebody thinks, that they're a team player, mm -hmm. that they really believe in that sort of chivalry. And as I mentioned before, the people with no experience usually are the ones that have grown with me the most because they don't know any other culture except mine. And my culture is one that loves them to death where all I can do is just tell their family how amazing they are and give them window offices and you know just keep giving them the, the benefits that you have uh, being an executive at a call center where they don't have that sort of additional stress and you also have to realize this there are situations that happen outside the office which may be affecting their performance in the office and without prying you have to understand that people have children to raise and families to take care of and so what I try to do is give timeouts to people or to readjust individuals or instead of just being so stringent on a clock, maybe take an extra minute, David, and just go put some water on your face, man, in between phone calls, because I, I just want you to reset yourself again. And so these are the sort of things since you and I sat in these cubicles, made these phone calls, under, understand what it's like to be there on a rainy Monday, you can kind of get somebody back into the groove again. And yeah. um, a lot of it is psychological, my friend, because this is a job that's not for introverts. This is a very social environment. And there's a lot of intense concentration because of the second language skills. And so you really want people to be on top of their game. Excellent. So now you are growing this organization. You have 300 people maxed out. What's your business like today? What are you up to? Where are you heading, Richard? Well, it's interesting. I have the capacity for 300, but I don't think I'm ever going to need it. After COVID, the labor laws here gave it to where we could only have 50% of the people here. We decided even after the laws went away to send about 80% of our people home for multiple reasons. The people that are on site is for PCI compliance, onboarding new agents, someone whose computer at home is not working or someone just wants to be here. But the market's changed. Most of the agents today are asking to be virtual, to work from home. Now, that's fine. And there is a labor pool for that. And I can fulfill clients' needs and, and get them the numbers that they want. But if I may be forthright with you and your audience, David, what it did is this is a brick and mortar. Besides having internet redundancy, a backup electricity generator and immediate IT support, they have me and you walking the roads, playing pinball and Pac-Man, doing on-site shadowing, training, feeding off of the synergy. And I believe that that has been taken away, almost like a painting to a print. And so people that just want to immediately start virtual, not even come into the center for a week for training, imagine that sort of relationship you have with them. They're just, they're just virtual. And so for me to keep up with the times I needed to adjust, but if I may vent a little bit, I believe a lot of what made us superior, or at least gave us an edge, was the sort of camaraderie that we had and the sort of on-site support that we were giving the agents. And so that has changed. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of companies would prefer to do things that are just non-voice at all. And that can frustrate people. And if you do finally get somebody on the phone, you're exploding and it's guns a blazing. So it's not that you're venting. Imagine the sort of reception that the agent is receiving. That can get somebody to quit when someone is cursing at you or just throwing knives. And so there has to be that sort of healthy balance. So the client is able to assist the people that are giving them the business and, and fulfilling their needs. 
because today all we're doing is just pressing zero and hoping to speak with someone, David. Yeah, and that's this is something that's affected major corporations. I know, like personally dealing with Facebook or Meta and Google and Microsoft, Verizon on a regular basis, man, their customer service has gone down so much because everything was decentralized. So when yeah. you're talking about the camaraderie and the training and even the healthy competition, we didn't mention that, but in a sales environment, that's crucial. It's fun. It lights people up inside. And even if you think you're performing at your best, they, you see somebody else hit that board first and you're like, wait a second here. And you start, you know, dialing for dollars like the guy from the, the pursuit of happiness. He didn't even move his phone. He just moved his finger, right? So for the business right. owners and the directors and the executives running call centers and just businesses that have outbound calling, what are the techniques and tips that you've seen work in your business that they can maybe apply to theirs? A thousand percent. It, it's quality control and quality assurance. The best way for self-improvement, David, is, is self-analysis. Now, you know, prior to this podcast, I was watching you fix your hair 10 times, which looks great, by the way. And so imagine if you didn't have a mirror. And it's the same thing with your voice. If individuals study, they're to, but they, then you make the argument of not enjoying how you sound. Well, guess what, Jeff? That's what you got. But I think if people will realize they might speak a little bit slower, a little bit louder, you know, their tone could be off a little bit their rhythms, their vocabularies. And so when they listen to these calls and they hear crosstalk or interruptions, that's on us. We didn't match their pace. If they didn't name drop enough or even the, the personal pronouns of the your and the are, these are the things that keep your attention because you don't want to exhaust the name drop. That should be done on transitional sentences, rebuttals and clarification questions. But every single sentence usually has a personal pronoun to keep their attention again. And so how about this? It's really about active listening. Since people are working from home right now, you might hear a dog or a child in the background. People, people shouldn't brush that aside. That's a perfect moment to anchor somebody and really connect with them with a me too technique, letting them know you love children or animals, but then doing the smart thing by asking a second or a third follow-up question, boy or girl, how old and what sort of breed and what's the name? And so, it gives you a chance to connect. Then they inadvertently and passive aggressively realize, David, that they might be disturbing the phone call and put them aside. And that's just, once again, a chance for you to really connect with somebody differently than that script that you're pitching them on. And so then you realize after 10 minutes that you're getting this appointment, that you're getting this sale, or you're getting this referral, what you did differently. What you did differently, David, is you were being you. This conversation we had prior to the podcast, we were discussing on, on why you're so successful. And I said, because you're extremely transparent, you're very pure, and you seem like someone's best friend or big brother. You said, well, Richard, that, that's just me. And I go, yeah, David, that is you. And if you weren't like that, you're out of character. And so I think that if somebody is natural, not a clown or acting the fool, but my goodness gracious, if you have something in common, stop for a second and talk about that thing. Because the person on the receiving end will then realize you're loosening your tie, you're a real person, and you were mentioning the professors that stutter, it's because they're, they're not vulnerable, but they're letting themselves be out there of being true. And I have no problem letting you know how much I love dogs, or how your son sounds really cool, and he sounds like, you know, he's a good baseball player or something, because you're about to go to the Little League game. And so... I love things like that because when I call you back, I'm going to ask about your anniversary. I'm going to ask about your promotion. Did Billy win his game last week? And you know perfectly well, David, no one else is asking you things on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes down to you choosing who you want to do business with, I may be more expensive. My contract might be different or it just might be a different deal altogether. But you have a good feeling about me. Just like you're willing to drive a couple extra blocks to that pizza place or to give that small five and dime or hardware store guy of the business because he just love him. He knows your name. When you show up, he, he walks with you and, and helps you pick things out. I, I love that sort of personal approach and I'm willing to pay for it. And don't make a hundred phone calls a day, David. Make about 85. Don't talk for five minutes. Talk for 10 minutes. 
Your QA department's going to freak out because you're ruining the numbers. You're not doing the average. Well, I'm not average, but look at my end result. They're much better than everybody else. I'm, I'm an artist. I might be commissioned, but don't limit me because then you don't get the best out of me. I think that's so well said. And I, I seriously think people should be rewinding Ooh. this episode. <laughs> yeah, people should be rewinding this episode, whether you're watching or listening. This is a sales masterclass, a communications masterclass. And Richard's bringing you some real gold that if it's passing you by, you need to be taking notes and applying it. Because this is excellent, excellent information that not everybody shares. So thank you. Now, it was right there. Boom. I was just going to say that. Because we're over Zoom, there's been several times where I've cut you off or we've talked over one another. That happens, especially in today's post mid COVID world, right? Cause so many people are doing zoom meetings. Are you teaching your people to give extra long pauses or are you just having them like what we're doing? Just, Oh, I'm sorry. And then moving on. How do you recommend the, the over speak when there's delays in virtual communication? Well, you got to be very careful because if you do things like that, it'll almost look like those dubbed Kung Fu movies where it really looks <laughs> off. So it's going to really throw you off. But no, I, listen, whatever happens on Zoom in regards to that, I, I think people can realize the rhythm. But the, the goal on the Zoom calls is to see what people have in the background. So mm -hmm. you can compliment someone's furniture or artwork or a stuffed bunny rabbit in the corner. And so I, I, it's almost a gold mine of information of what people give you when you're able to look into their environment. But people aren't used to this. I mean, sure, in a meeting, they might be asked a question and occasionally a glance will be in their direction. But in Zoom, you're really just focused on this camera the whole time. It almost reminds me of Cindy Brady in the Brady Bunch when she lost her mind with that red light above the camera. And so... It could be memorizing. It, it, it could something that could throw your game off. But you know, to me, I, I just think that you should just almost enjoy it because we're very fortunate with technology to be able to do this. Fifty years ago, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But the fact that I'm able to not have to jump on a flight to sit with you and do an interview, it, it, it's Hey, it would have been amazing to do, but then again, it's a lot of time, money, effort, and, and organization. And so I wish you'd embrace the positive of it and, and just take it from there. Yeah. So to our listeners, whether you've been in sales for years or you're a new beginner, what Richard's talking about is observing the environment is crucial. The key is be genuine. Uh, would you agree with that? Like no, hundred I mean, percent. If they have a picture of them fishing and you don't fish, don't strike up too many questions about them. Be like, I love fishing. Don't lie, but be genuine. Maybe say, Hey, man, that's awesome. You caught that. I've always wanted to go deep sea, deep sea fishing, but I've never gone. What's it like? It has to be real to connect. Correct. Yes, yes, yes. But how about this? Imagine if there's a child there, but you don't have child. A child. You were a child to your parents. You might not have grandchildren, but you were a grandchild. So I might not be an expert fisherman, but maybe there was one time I went out in Margate, New Jersey, deep sea fishing to go for bluefish. And, you know, I'm not saying it's once again, I can't hit threes, but I did it or I observed it. And I think it's pretty cool. You know, I'm not rattling off Elvis Presley albums, but I did like the thing. And so I, I do find if you show that you're authentic and sincere, even if it's the first time seeing something like Daniel's son, when he saw Mr. Miyagi's bonsai tree, there could still be a very sincere interest in something. Even if you mispronounce it, trust me, you'll get away with it. It'll be something that they'll talk about. And you brought up something brilliant, David. Prior to a phone call, custom-made email or voicemail, you could should, well, you really should look at a LinkedIn profile or an email or, or a website. Mm -hmm. Because you'd be able to see certain individuals, if they wear a tie, if they don't, maybe what a loading dock looks like, a company culture. If you Googled me, you'd see my pinball machines and my neon lights. And so if you got me on the phone and one of the first things you said was, Richard, I love your pinball machines and jukeboxes, 
you just got five minutes. It's yours to lose. There's certain ways you can buy time on a call. Not saying I'm going to give you my credit card, but you impressed me enough. You did enough due diligence and showed such interest that I gave you a five minute buffer. It's almost like recess. You can do whatever you want with it. And some people have been clever enough to jump clouds where you buy 30 seconds to two minutes of time with a transitional sentence or a tie down or a positive escalation or just recapping what people are interested in to see if you can keep getting some roots and branches to it. And so stop rushing phone calls because if you find a section where you can anchor, and we mentioned so many, make camp, see how much that thing can grow before you move forward. Absolutely. And take notes. Richard mentioned that earlier. There's nothing wrong with taking notes during a meeting, even if you do it privately. You know, like, oh man, this person likes Ch -ch -ch, their son's name is Ch -ch -ch, their birthday is Ch -ch -ch, and put that in your phone because later you can review. I don't know about you guys and girls, but I don't remember everything. But having those notes in my phone helps me so really smart. connect. You are so smart, David. My God, I would have cheered off you in high school. Whatever. One of the greatest bits of advice that was given to me was dictation. Are you capable of doing dictation? Why? I'm not in the moment. I got you, man. But if I can write down 99% of what you said, and if I just, it's more about just no taking, but I don't need to be engaged. You win because you have the luxury of reviewing it. And then if you do a meeting minutes, after a phone call, imagine that sort of impression that you're giving. And so you can't space out and only take notes, but if you can do both and balance that, and I'm excellent at dictation, I can do shorthand, and also I can type as you talk. And it really is a benefit, David, because you have all that intel on your side. And also, there's no miscommunication because if you said Tuesday and then all of a sudden you thought it was Wednesday, no, no, you mentioned Tuesday. <laughs> I got it here. And so it's an excellent way to save yourself too. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And again, this is kind of like a sales fire hose to your brain right now if you're listening. And we've talked with this in other podcasts if you're a regular listener or if you're new, but when you are a t-shirt manufacturer or a physician or you're a pizzeria, it doesn't matter today how good you are. Marketing is what drives the business, sadly. And I'm a marketing professional, right? Because there's products that we've all heard of that are mediocre at best, and you're paying high rates for this t-shirt. It's all marketing. So if you are a great physician, you either need to get someone who understands the marketing and the sales psychology or you need to become that person. So take this, take notes, and you don't have to apply everything. Richard's been doing this for years and he's a master at it. But take one, apply it, master it. Take another, apply it, master it. And then like Richard, it's gonna become second nature. So don't get discouraged, but just start because anything you apply from our conversation today, you're gonna benefit from and you're just gonna be a better person. And when you sell somebody something, if you're being honest and real, you're helping them. So you are helping people push through all the liars, push through all the terrible products, push through all the fake services to get to something you can provide them that's real and quality. So Richard, if somebody wants to connect with you, where are you today? Are you running the call center? Are you doing any coaching? What, what's your world look like today? Where are you and where are you heading? Well, my suggestion if someone wants to connect with me is to grab a first class plane ticket and fly down and come visit me here. <laughs> I'm sure and you I might think they would like that. On that one. Hey, I just wanted to jump on one last thing that you were mentioning. Oh. That, you know, when, when people are, are making these calls, I, I, I think it's very important for them to once again, just to keep their ethics on this. Because from an educated point of view, somebody makes a decision. I'm not, I can't bat a thousand, but how about this, David? If I can go 15 rounds and I can explain my product A to Z and one, two, three, and just by default or another reason you do not choose to do it, I feel satisfied because I went the distance. From an educated point of view, you made a decision. I can give you three quick examples on, on how a phone call could die with me. We're on a call, things are perfect, dying to work with one another. But then a client asks if I do 24-7. We don't do 
So from an educated point of view, I, I, I got to reject it. Do I speak Chinese? No, I'll do Spanish, Portuguese, and English. But if I can't personally speak the language, it would be difficult for me. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I could have a rogue agent. So, so no, I'd have to refuse that account. How about this? If you can match the rates offshore in India and the Philippines for a couple dollars an hour, I'll give you a thousand seats. Well, I could offer. It doesn't mean anyone's going to take it. And so from my end, I have to let you know that it's not a really a very attractive offer. And so there are certain times when we check 99 out of 100 boxes, literally a perfect fit. But in that 15th round, something comes up, which, which kills it. And it's, and it's a shame because we really are a perfect fit. But then once again, there's that one screw that won't turn. And it just, you just can't take the account ethically in, in regards to that. But also to answer your question earlier, I got a very large Facebook fan page, David, about 103,000 local Costa Rican Ticos, and they can't wait to meet you. It will, it will give your audience a pulse on what's happening in the business process outsourcing in Central America. Now, you have an international audience. We are north of Panama, south of Nicaragua. Costa Rica is the only democratic society in Central America. There's no standing army. There's a 95% literacy rate. They claim that Costa Rica has the best infrastructure and the most neutral of English accents. And what we spoke about in the beginning of the podcast, we're very, very much known for ecotourism and also people come here for medical tourism, a very large expat retired population. And plus I'm here. I got a thousand suggestions to make in regards to hot springs and beaches and surfing and exotic fruits and fun. So I'd love to have you and your audience come visit me here in Costa Rica. Oh, thank you so much for being here today with us, Richard. It's been valuable. It's been powerful. It's been concise. So from your birth through today to where you're going, is there anything we missed in your life story or any closing thoughts you want to leave with our community? Well, first is I can't thank you enough, David. I, I've really enjoyed being a guest on your podcast. Your audience is amazing. But my, my last bit of advice, my friend is that there are a lot of naysayers and gray believers that are out there. People that love you, they just don't understand the mission that you're on. And as I just say, hold firm and enjoy your life. It's very short. You only get 100 years. And I think that each one of us has some sort of destiny. It doesn't necessarily have to be a call center owner. And hopefully today I was able to shatter any sort of misconceptions you may have about call centers and CEOs. But I also believe that I was given a gift. I married the girl of my dreams. We started the company together. I've been in Costa Rica over 20 years and you see the smile on my face. I'm, I'm living a very happy life. And I'm just hoping that for you and all of your listeners as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Richard. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. I can't wait to do some follow-up calls. Maybe we'll see you in Costa Rica. Sounds like a plan, my man. Yes. And ladies and gentlemen, like our slogan says, don't just listen to this great content that Richard brought you today, but do it. Repeat the good things that apply to you each day so you can have a remarkable life in this world and most importantly to eternity to come. Because you can make a million dollars, you can make $10 billion, but if you're doing it unethically, it's not worth it. Think mm -hmm. about eternity because like Richard said, you might be blessed to get 100 years on this earth, but that's a speck of sand from a speck of sand in eternity. So that's it. We love you. We'll catch you in the next episode. And Richard, thank you again so much for being here, my friend. You got it, David. All right. Ciao. The Remarkable People Podcast. Check it out. The Remarkable People Podcast. Listen. Do. Repeat for life.